Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And Jesus is that light of life. Today is November 5th, 2024. For those of you that don't know it, in the UK, today is uh, Guy Fawkes Day. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the gunpowder plot. King James was putting together the Bible and the Catholics did not want that, the Jesuits. So they tried putting uh, kegs of gunpowder in the basement underneath Parliament. And they were going to blow up Parliament with King James. And uh, Parliament is basically the UK's equivalent to our Congress. And kill them all. And then try to have uh, the Pope take over England. But God was on King James' side, and uh, what was it? Like nine years later, he put had they put together the Bible bearing his name. So, those of us across the pond, as the Brits call it, uh, we don't really know about Guy Fawkes, but if you look at the uh, the actor that wore the mask for V for Vendetta, if you ever saw that movie, that was uh, that mask was modeled after Guy Fawkes. And funny, they take the train loaded with uh, explosives and sent it under Parliament in the movie. That is so. Yeah. So, uh, what else? Oh, yeah. I voted today. Today is the presidential election day in the United States. I wrote in for uh, President Jesus Christ as my write-in candidate, but uh, uh, no. When the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes, he's not going to be president. He's going to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so. So, all right, let's uh, take a look at some things. All right, let's turn our King James Bible to Luke chapter 16. You know, somebody, I kept uh, getting some things about how the Septuagint Bible, uh, which was the translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek under the, I think it was Alexander or one of Alexander's generals, Alexander the Great, they call him because he was a great conqueror. Uh, I examined the Brenton translation, which is the most, uh, it seems to be the most widely respected popular one. And I looked at the Genesis 6 and compared it with Job 38. Now, Genesis 6 is where the sons of God intermarried with the daughters of men. When you look at Job 38, it said that the sons of God shouted for joy at the foundation or the creation of the earth. Now, Adam didn't exist until six days after the earth existed because he was formed of the dust of the earth. So these sons of God existed prior to the earth. Therefore, they could not possibly be anything to do with Adam. The King James makes this perfectly clear. And when the in Genesis 6, when the 
sons of God married the daughters of men, they had giants for children. Well, guess what? You ever heard of ogres? Cyclops? Yeah. Okay? They're not mere legends. And then God got angry with the whole mess and decided to flood the world and uh, drown everybody. Well, I compare that to the Brenton uh, Septuagint. Supposedly, they wanted a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures for the library at Alexandria. Purportedly, it was the greatest library in existence at the time. And, of course, Rome burned it and destroyed it. So, they say Rome was uh, great builders, but they were also great destroyers. So, I don't know. But the Septuagint, in Genesis 6, they take the same word and translate it as sons of God. But then in Job 38, they took the same word and translated it as angels. Now, at least the King James was consistent. Sons of God, sons of God. Septuagint didn't do that with the English translation. Now, I'm not condemning the Greek because I don't know enough about it to say good, bad, either way or the other. But I do know that when you read Genesis 6 and you go to Job 38, one says sons of God and the other says angels, you don't make the word association. As far as I'm concerned, it's two different, two different things. At least the King James was consistent. Now, people will complain that uh, the word Gentile sometimes was translated as nation, nor nations rather, uh, Gentile Gentiles, nation or nations, and then other times uh, it was Gentile. So unless you knew it was the same word, you may not catch the association. But the thing is, sometimes the Lord hides a thing because they want you to dig it out. And of course, the enemies of the King James will tell you, oh, well, this is an error. Oh, their King James is full of errors. But in Proverbs 25 and verse 2, we read, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Sometimes God, God hides things so that we have to dig out the meaning. And if the Lord doesn't show you, you'll never get it. So, what they say is an error may not be. If the Lord reveals something to you, rejoice. Seriously. And I'm I don't know. Anytime I hear somebody telling me that King James is full of errors, well, I don't listen to them because, you know, they don't, they never, they never show me a plain error. I, I've never had anybody show me this. And when I, my first year of being a believer, actually in the first few months, uh, the Lord showed me the King James was his word. Uh, I don't know how to explain it, but he showed me. I mean, he didn't physically appear to me and say, oh, that's it. But just all the things, everything just fell in line. So, all right, let's go to Luke chapter 16. So, and that's why I don't, I, you know, when people don't use the uh, when they use the wrong Bible, I I'm skeptical from the very beginning, but I don't know. 
All right, Luke 16, verse 1. And he, Jesus, and he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward. What's a steward? It's a, a servant. And the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer for thou mayest be no longer steward. Steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. Hmm. Should have thought of that before you were wasting away your Lord's stuff, right? Verse 4. I am resolved what to do. That, when I am put out of the stewardship, that uh, they may receive me into their ho houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. So he owed him a hundred, but he says, You're only going to pay fifty. Verse 7. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write fourscore. Fourscore is twenty times four. That's eighty. So he owed him a hundred measures of wheat, but he's only going to owe him eighty. Verse 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. You know, when it comes to cheating people out of their stuff, the children of this world are wiser on how to steal, lie, and cheat than the trusting sheep. Think about it. Boy, I learned that lesson in Arkansas. All right, verse 9. And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. What is mammon? Uh, basically riches. Uh, an abundance of wealth. Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. What well, everlasting habitations? Where do you think the uh, the unrighteous are going to go? The lake of fire. Verse ten. He that is unfaithful in that which is least. He that is faithful in that which is least, is faith faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So if you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the big things too. Verse 12. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 11. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? What is the true riches? Faith in Christ. Eternal life. I mean, think about it. That's the, that's the true riches in this world. There's nothing in this world that I would rather have 
and most believers I know are poor as church mice, so yeah. Verse 12, And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You either want the things of God or you want the things of the riches of this world. You can't have both. Everybody that I've ever known, well, not personally known, but researched, who are extremely wealthy, did not get it by what I would call their own merit. They always find a way to cheat people out of things that are rightfully theirs. So, I, it, without fail, I mean, like every time, uh, and they never have enough. You know, there's a reason why the Lord said uh, it would be easier to thread a camel through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Because, Rich people, they don't care who they cheat and steal from. They never have enough. I mean, I've known some rich people, and that's what they love. That's what they care about. You know, they might get married to somebody, uh, but, you know, as soon as they find something better come along, there's no loyalty. I've seen it so many times. It's just unbelievable. They love money. Uh, I remember somebody once told me, good people love people and use things, and evil people love things and use people. I think I got that right. So, Verse 14, and the Pharisees also, who were covetous, covetous, you know, they were greedy, heard all these things and they derided him. Oh, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. God gives us all this wealth because he loves us and he's blessed us and because, you know, we're, you know, we're greedy and he gives us everything we want. I think it was Joel Osteen that said, you're living your best life now. Wow, think about it. Because you know what? Their, uh, their best life is not gonna be in the life to come. I mean, you think this evil, wicked world is gonna be better than the kingdom, but they're not going to make it to the kingdom. So their best life is here right now. Because they're probably, almost without fail, going into the lake of fire. So when he says, your best life is now, he's not lying. Sad. Because they want the things of this world. They think God is their genie. The name it, claim it, uh... They call them the name it, claim it cloud, uh, crowd. The uh, positive confession. Oh, God wants me rich, so he's going to give me money. You know, you think God is a genie with, you know, you rub the magic light lamp and he's going to pop out and give you three wishes. Money, money, money. But it's not how it works. So... And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. Boy, that's scary, people. God knows our hearts. 
For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. What is highly esteemed among mankind? Oh, having a thousand dollar Italian suit, a Maserati or a Lotus or a Ferrari or a Bentley Rolls Royce or a Mercedes. Highly esteemed among men, right? Uh, Gucci shoes, I don't know. Louis Vuitton handbags, I don't know. Highly esteemed of this world. An abomination in the sight of God. Verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Oh uh, boy. I have committed adultery a bunch of times. And I'm not proud of it. I'm not bragging. Boy, I'll tell you what. I'm surprised the Lord didn't kill me long ago. So, yep. Fortunately, I had a girl that actually, actually loved me. And I ruined that too. Oh, well. You live and learn. So... All right, let's uh, let's keep reading. Verse nineteen. This is the story, not a parable. The story of the rich man and Lazarus. Probably not the Lazarus that was raised from the dead, but another Lazarus. Nineteen. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. Purple has been in the past the color of royalty. There was a shellfish called the Murex, M-U-R-E-X. It almost went extinct, but it produced a dye they could use it to produce a dye that was purple and a very rich, deep purple. And no, not uh, John Lord and uh, Richie Blackmore deep purple. No. Yeah, 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 I know about them. Grew up with them in high school. Um, but purple was the color of royalty. Matter of fact, there were certain kings in Europe that had a decree that and only a only a royalty only a member of the royal family could wear purple if a commoner was caught with it they could possibly lose their lives but there was a severe penalty i'm not sure if it was death but you didn't want to get caught with purple wearing purple no So, he was clothed in purple and fine linen. He had some nice looking clothes. Duds, right? And fared sumptuously every day. Sumptuously means he ate well. Not only good abundance, but very good delicacies. Verse 20. And there was... A certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. You would think that this rich man would uh, maybe made a plate for Lazarus. What do you think? No. The crumbs that fell off the table, it 
fell on the ground, covered with dirt. That's what Lazarus had to eat. You know, I've actually known people that have worked at restaurants that the restaurant owners told the employees to throw the food in the garbage rather than give it to the employees. Can you imagine that? I would not want to be that person on Judgment Day. Let's take a look at something. Let's take a look at James chapter 2. Now, if you don't know it, James had a father named Joseph and a mother named Mary. Uh, guess who he grew up with? Yeah. I'm going to give you three guesses. And it wasn't King Herod. And it was, wasn't Pontius Pilate either. Yeah. Verse 13. James chapter 2, verse 13. James was a bishop of the church. I don't remember which one. But... Uh, yeah, he became a bishop of the church. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. So if you don't show mercy, you're going to have judgment without mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith, and have not works, can faith save him? You always hear people say, oh, we're not saved by faith. I mean, we're saved by faith and not by works. Well, if you're doing good works to be saved, you miss the point. But if you have faith, good works will follow faith without fail. So, Verse 15, James writes, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, they don't have anything to eat. And one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? What good are you? You know, you're, you got you got five coats in your closet that you've you haven't worn in years, and you won't even take some castaway clothes and give it to somebody. It's just winter time and they're freezing to death, and and you'd rather throw food in the garbage than give it to somebody. Really, I've met people like that. They'll get their reward. Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Even Satan believes in God, but his works are evil, are they not? I think you get the point. So what did the rich man do? Did he, he, did he make Lazarus a, a bowl of food every day? No. No, when the stuff fell on the floor, eh, you could have that, Lazarus. I'm not going to eat that. It fell on the floor. It's full of sand. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Luke 16 and verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels. 
Do you know that we're carried by the angels? Someplace? I wonder if the wicked are carried by Satan's angels. And the not wicked are carried by the, the good angels. And yes, a third of Satan's a third of the angels fell with Satan. A third. Can you imagine that? A third of the angels. There was a war in heaven. Read Revelation chapter 12. I did many a study on that. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I remember this is Old Testament. Jesus hasn't uh, died and been resurrected yet. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Whoa. Now remember, Abraham, God made an everlasting covenant with Abraham, and with Abraham's son Isaac, and with Isaac's son Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 24, and he, the rich man, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, what? Father Abraham? This rich man was a child of Abraham. And Abraham's going to actually acknowledge that. He is one of Abraham's descendants that God made an everlasting covenant with. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Father Abraham, and Abraham says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Huh. Did this rich man do anything for Lazarus? Like the book of James said? You know, oh, be ye warmed and filled. May you depart in peace. But he didn't give him did he prepare a, table, a seat at the table for him? No. The crumbs that fell from the table. That fell on the dirty ground. Probably threw all the food in the garbage. I've met people like that. I, You know, when they say there's going to be hell to pay, there's going to be hell to pay. Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Hey, rich man, you got everything in this world that you wanted. You had nice clothing, purple, and a beautiful house. Great food. You had riches. You had gold and silver. And a beautiful house. You got everything in this world that you wanted. You didn't want the things of God. You wanted the things of this world. And... The Lord let you have exactly what you wanted. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and, and you, there is a great gulf 
fixed. A gulf is like a valley. You've heard of the Gulf of Mexico? It's like a big valley. There's a valley between the rich man and his flames of fire. And then there's the non-smoking section. Well, you know the old saying where there's smoke, there's fire. Well, lay Abraham's bosom, there's no fire, so there's it's the non-smoking section. That's my that's the Bob translation. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. See, there's no way for Lazarus to go to the rich man, and there's no way for the rich man to go to Lazarus. Otherwise, he'd leave the flames. Verse 27. Then he said, the rich man, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus to my father's house, his children, to my brothers, right? For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Hmm. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets. Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The blessings and the curse. Moses is attributed. And then you have the prophets, which is Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, probably you could argue Job, Micah, Amos, Obadiah, I could go on, but you get the idea. The law, which is Moses and the prophets. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So the rich man says, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. You know, repentance is something... You don't even hear it taught anymore. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He also said that, uh, well, let's take a look. In Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13, 5, Jesus says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. But what else did Jesus say about that? In Matthew 5, 20, Jesus says, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. I mean, seriously, these people, they kept the law. But their righteousness was just to appear before men. But if we aren't better than they are, we're not going to make it in. So let's go back to Luke 16, verse 30. And he, the rich man, said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he, Abraham, said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So, you know, there's actually people that tell you that Jesus really didn't die on the cross. Yeah, he got beaten and crucified and nails poked uh nailed in through his body and a spear stuck into his side but he really wasn't dead he just passed out and then 
you know, three days later, he woke up from his sleep and crawled out from the tomb and, you know, oh, I'm alive. I rose from the dead. And there's people who actually teach this stuff, believe it or not. I think they call that the swoon, S-W-O-O-N theory, I think they call it. I I haven't, it was 20, some, 20 years ago when I was reading about all this stuff, but but there are those that say that. Uh, usually they are of the Pharisee persuasion. So, do you know that in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve were made without sin, nature, and had they obeyed God, they would have lived forever in their natural bodies. In Genesis 2.16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but, there's always that but, and you know what goats do? They butt. They do head butts. Uh, what does the Lord say? He's going to separate the goats from the, the sheep. And the church of Satan, what is their symbol? The goat. Oh, yeah. They know what they are. Believe me, they do. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Uh, they're going to die physical death. Now, if my understanding is correct, Adam's been in Abraham's bosom for several thousand years now. At least maybe two or three. Think about it. Supposedly all the Old Testament saints went to Abraham's bosom because they were afflicted with sin nature. Let's read about Adam in the New Testament. Romans 5.14 Nevertheless, death, physical death, reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Death was passed along in our DNA, believe it or not. In 1 Corinthians 15.45, and so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The first Adam was made from the ground. The last Adam was Christ. Uh, you see, the last Adam had the same mother and father as the first Adam. Does that make sense to you? Adam... Adam didn't have a mother, and Christ really didn't either when you think about it. Yeah, Mary carried him in her womb, but she, she really, her DNA wasn't used. Adam and Christ had the same, I guess you could say, bodily makeup. You know, if they hadn't put Christ to death, he would have lived forever if he was the same as Adam. So, I hope that makes sense. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So, Adam would have lived forever and probably Christ, too, if they hadn't killed him. No old age. And, of course, Adam lived, oh, I forget how many years. Let's take a look. In Genesis 5.5, 5, 
And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Uh, and then people will say, see, there the King James Bible is in error. It said that in the day he eats thereof of the tree of good and evil, he's going to die. But he lived 930 years. That's not a day. But are we talking human time or God's time? In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant, means you don't know something. Be not ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So when Adam died after 930 years, he died in the day thereof of the Lord. Think about it. Let's go to the book of Job, chapter 19, verse 23. Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. That they were graven with an iron pen and led in the rock forever. Verse 25, listen carefully. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Uh, what is a redeemer? If you pawned a watch because you were out of money and then you get the money that were owed plus interest and went back whatever the month later, however long you got to redeem it, you pay them the money they lent you plus the interest you can redeem your watch and get it back. But Christ redeemed us from hell and death by his blood. Think about that. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day, the last day, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Who's the Redeemer? Christ! And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. He's going to, even though the worms destroyed his, his earthly body, in his flesh, his celestial body, his heavenly body, his resurrected body, he's going to see God. Job knew this. Verse 27. Whom I shall see for myself. Who's he going to see? God. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. But ye should say, why persecute we him seeing the root of the matter is found in me, be ye, be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishments of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. There is a sword on this earth, and then there's a judgment after you die. Hmm. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. All right, let's take a look at some things here. Let's read uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus speaking, a good man out of the treasure of the heart, out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words 
thou shalt be condemned. Boy, that's some powerful stuff right there. In Matthew 10, verse 33, Jesus speaking, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Can you imagine that? Oh, I don't know this guy. Get him out of here. Verse 34. Uh, four. Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So if you confess Jesus before men, Jesus will confess he knows you before the Father. But if you deny that you know Jesus before men, Jesus will deny you before the Father and his angels, believe it or not. Back to Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Will you acknowledge Jesus? Will you deny Jesus? Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Oh, we want to see a magic trick. 39. But he, Jesus, answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign, and there and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. You know Jonah, Jonah and the whale? Verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now remember, in a previous study, heaven's up, hell is down. So if Jesus is going to... Well, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. And it says here that Jesus is the Son of Man. He's going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What's he going to be doing for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? My guess would be preaching to those that are in Abraham's bosom, the non-smoking section. That's my guess. And I we're going to do a part two of this. Where did Jesus go for three days and three nights? Into the earth. Verse 41. The men of Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And Jonah was sent to Nineveh. And when he got spit out of that great fish or whale on the seashore, in front of all the fishermen on the beach... They probably thought, oh, Dagon, our fish god, has sent a prophet to speak to us. And then Jonah went and preached to the king and people in Nineveh. And they repented. Yeah, I did a Bible study on Jonah and the whale. It's not a children's tale. There is some far deep meanings, meaning in that especially when you know Christ is telling you he's going to be doing like Jonah did. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Is Christ greater than Jonah? Absolutely. 
Christ created the heaven and the earth. Verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. All right, let's look at 1 Peter 3.17 real quick. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You know, if you rob somebody and you go to jail, yeah, you're going to suffer for it, but it's better that you be persecuted for righteousness. You know, they're arresting people for praying in front of abortion clinics all over the world, including the U.S., that supposedly has free speech. Yeah, that would be suffering for well-doing. Verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, redeeming us, right? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What? What? When did... When did Jesus preach to the spirits in prison? Now, some people will try to convince you that he's going to hell to preach to the fallen angels. I don't think so. Uh-uh. These spirits are the spirits of the right, those that are God's people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Adam. Samson, those by which also he, Christ, went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Hell was prison, people. Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, but when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a praying was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers, being made subject unto him. See, after three days, Christ was resurrected. But on those three days, he was in the prison, preaching to the prison house. Hell. That's my guess, anyway. So, all right, it's been an hour. We're going to make this a part, well, part one, I guess, of... Yeah, and then we'll do part two probably tomorrow. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.